What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Draymond Green Show YouTube channel. Make sure you hit that subscribe button. Make sure you like the post that you love, but you can get everything the Draymond Green Show right on our YouTube channel. So make sure you subscribe. Check that out. Thank you. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Draymond Green Show. I am honored to um, host this next guest, which has already been on the Draymond Green Show. Uh, six man of the year, three times. Made that whole thing about a six man uh, have any relevance. So we're going to get into that. But first off, we're live. Well, live to you. Not necessarily live right now, but we're at Hinkle Field House in Indianapolis, Indiana. All-star game. But this legendary place, uh, honored. Thank you to Butler University for having us in this gym. Now, I see this banner up here, Final Four 2010 banner, and I'm not happy about it because Gordon Hayward fouled me to get that banner. He well, clearly fouled you. It's insane. On the front of the newspaper, his hand is like this. Oh, yes, we're, we're down one to go to the national championship. And so, yes, they would have had the banner. But it says national finalist, and that should have been me. And I think that we would have won the championship. Nonetheless, I'm thankful to be here. Ma, welcome to the show. My welcome dog. back to the welcome show. Welcome back. Repeat offender. Absolutely. Yes, sir. Get in on the action with the DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. New customers who deposit $5 or more can get a no-sweat bet up to $1 thousand dollars back in bonus bets how cool of a deal is that all you have to do is download the DraftKings sportsbook app now it takes 90 seconds and use the code colin c-o-l-i-n this is the best deal you're gonna find new customers it's a no sweat bet up to a thousand dollars if your first bet loses how cool is that only at DraftKings sportsbook code is colin the crown is yours Man, I, I got a lot of topics to get into it with you. Um, one being, and, and I want to jump right into this, I think, you know, when we start looking at the NIL culture um, and, 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 you know, where college basketball is going, it's all stemming from AAU yes. uh, and what AAU has done. And you are at the heart of that with Seattle Rotary, uh, your young fella, JJ, coming up in the pipeline, just I want to start off with what's your take on where the AAU game is right now? That's a great question. And and I wasn't really a part of AAU culture before him, to be honest with you. Like, how many years did you play AAU coming up? I played AAU from sixth grade to 12th grade. I played AAU two years, really? period. So I played in fifth grade, left when worked on my game, and came back and played my last year. That's so I wasn't really hip to how AAU works, to be honest with you. Then I got back in it through him just being a parent. I was I was a parent before I started coaching him that kept score. I was just keeping score. You know, I didn't mess with the coaches. I was just right there just keeping score, and that was that. It gave me a way to kind of watch him in peace a little mm -hmm. bit. You know what I'm saying? So I just kept score. And then, as fate would have it, I started being an assistant coach. The coach asked me, Daryl Henney shouts, and he runs the whole program. It's his program. And then I got to become the coach. And what I've seen is, it's kind of nasty in some ways. Dude. Yeah. In some ways, it's kind of, I'm going to be honest with you, it's kind of nasty from the standpoint. Some of these coaches, they want the top kid, they want to fly kids around. And I'm not faulting the kid at all, because if you coming from where we come from, and somebody's like, I'm going to get you some shoes, some flights to see the, the rest of the country. Parents, and they trust the coach, it's mm -hmm. all good. But them coaches, man, they, they, they're playing through kids in some regards. They're not really helping them. Mm -hmm. They'll have, you know, just, older kids or whatever it is to try to say, look at me, look what my team is doing. Your guy, Trav, does it right. Mm -hmm. One of the few to do it right. I mean, like, we've talked where it's like, he's really pouring into the kids. He's not for the wins and losses now. He's trying to help them later. And that's what we're trying to do myself. We're one of the only staffs to have all three coaches that play D1. Wow. Myself, Keith Smith, that played at Oregon and Pepperdine, and Real Hennings that played at uh, UC Davis. Mm -hmm. And so what we're doing is, with our team, we're trying to, we watch a film, we're practicing three times a week. We're doing the skill stuff that's like, what's in your bag? But we're doing the skill stuff like, nah, fuck what's just in your bag handling. This may be a catch and shoot game. Mm -hmm. This may be a game you got to take charge. This got to be a game you got to give yourself up to get the team, you know, good shots. Yeah. So we're teaching that because we're teaching them 
how to play now, but more importantly, how to play later mm -hmm. and be good young men. So for us, that's what it's about. So that's that that leads me to my next question. Um, a lot of young NBA, well, a lot of NBA players now have sons that's coming up. You got JJ, uh, Trevor, Ariza, Taj, yeah. um, Gilbert, Elijah. And there's been a lot of talk about Gilbert and his approach with his son and everybody else approaching. I think, you know, Gilbert has been very public about it and saying, you know, he wanted his son to learn how to carry. And so he kind of sent him to a school that's not great basketball. I think it's Chatsworth or something. Uh -huh. uh, not not great basketball team, but he's the man and he get to do whatever. And that's a different approach, right? Like, and then you have some people that, you know, send their kids to powerhouse. I know you went to Rainier. I don't know if you would send JJ there or not, but uh -huh. what's your take on kind of the approach of sending your kid to a team that, it's essentially trash and he get to do what he want, but may not necessarily be learning how to play the game the right way or going to a powerhouse like Rainier where there's a pedigree, you're going to play the right way. Coach probably been there for a while or there's some type of history there right. that you follow. What's your take on, on those two philosophies? That's a great question. So for us, let's just say Rotary right now, I feel like we got nine players. I feel like basically all nine would be the best they can go to any other team and be the best player. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I have the, all them playing as a team. And for me, that's needed because I want them to go for good to great. Yeah, you have to be a dog and a killer. But for me, setting the foundation for them, I want them to know how to play the right way. So we, we actually call ourselves the Warriors. If you watch us play, like we, the ball's hopping. Mm -hmm. we, we've mastered random. You know what I'm saying? Yep. So it's like, and Trav will tell you, like we shoot a lot of threes, but it's, they're, they're generated off of like, good plays, good possessions. So I'm teaching him to, to function playing with other good players. Yes. Now, for JJ especially, he's playing up, right? So they're eighth grader, he's in seven. Mm -hmm. So he knows he's, man, he's benefits a lot of it off because of the ball movement. But next year, he's going to have to play eighth grade. Mm -hmm. And he's going to have to carry a load. But he's ready for that too. So what I did to supplement that is I had him play for a school team. I had him play feeder. And he does that there. So he's getting the best of both worlds. Mm -hmm. But I think knowing how to play is the most important thing because as you know, you better than anybody. As the higher you go, mm -hmm. the, the 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 smaller the box gets of greatness for everybody. Yeah. But it's also like this is the top of the top. Mm -hmm. So you can't just go in there being a one man band. You can't just go in there being a one man show. Mm -hmm. You have to learn. The better you get, and the the higher levels you go, you have to learn to play with good players. Absolutely. So either way, it's going to be an adjustment. But I think you still get that dog, and I'm not faulting Gilbert because he's doing it his way and mm -hmm. it's working. Mm -hmm. So. Yes, but at a certain point, even his son's going to have to, you know, yeah. conform and know how to play with other people and still not lose himself while doing it. Yes, I think I think that's a very important thing and not losing yourself. Because you you sometimes you get to the league or it happens for different people at different right, stages. At different sometimes times. it's high school for some guys, college for some guys, NBA for some. Like I was a scorer till I got to the NBA, right. you know, and then you got to like figure it out. Right. You know? And so, but I think that's interesting from you because what I've watched in you uh, all these years and playing against you, but even going further back and just watching before I ever got to the NBA, you've always known how to play the game the right way. But yeah, you've also had coaches that's like, here, Ma, go do your go thing. Go do it, right. Like, go do your shit. Go to the ball. You call a pick and roll whenever you want to. You flatten out, you call an ISO whenever you want right. to. Like, and... It sounds like that's what I'm hearing you say. Like, I'm essentially training J.J. to be the same thing, where he can mix you, he, he got all the stuff, but, yeah, he know how to play the game. And, and with J.J., right, and let's say he plays his grade, and he's like, Dad, I can get 40. I'm like, yeah, 40 is cool. I would rather have you get 28 and 12 assists. Yes. That's more than 40. And, and I told him, I said, Luca, how much did he have? He said he had 73. I said, yeah, but he had 13 assists, too. The trick is this. All great scores, the more you pass, the easier it is to score, mm -hmm. right? Because you put them in a trick bag. So if you have, even the game, my last game, I had 51 points, I had five assists. Yes. Right? So I'm like, if if Luca only had five assists that game, they may have been a 55-point game because they know he's just going to score. Yeah. But the fact he has 73 and now he has 14 assists, they don't know how to guard him. Mm -hmm. They put him in a trick bag. If 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 I can make, if I can have JJ look at one player, just one player, and he had to study one player, it would be Penny Hardaway, mm. but a better shooter. Because I want him to be able to really, like, to do this as well as score. 
And right now with him playing up, the physicality kind of bothers him to do that because he can actually pass and dribble as good as he can shoot. But you don't, you'll never know it until he kind of, his physicality catches up to his game. That's incredible. Um, and switching gears, uh, you just you you just spoke about having you just spoke about having fifty one points, yeah. uh, and I mean you've done that. But I want to talk about something with with the NBA and with veterans and how it kind of happens for guys towards the end of the career, and it's be, it's becoming more and more prevalent now, especially with the new CBA and stuff. Right. You got veteran minimums where a veteran. Be making three million dollars and they can get the they young get on kid the side, right. <laughs> for one point one million dollars. Right. In a situation like the Golden State Warriors, that three million dollars is actually fifteen million dollars. It's fifteen through the tax and everything else. Of the right? tax, and so Damn, I know it's a high still. And because we're in the repeater tax, yes. And oh, now okay, you got okay, that okay, first okay. April, second April. If I'm not mistaken, I think we're already at the second April, and so the penalties are crazy, but. It's putting guys in a tough situation as well. Here you are, you score 51 points, and then the next year, you're not on an NBA roster. How is that possible, you know? And so just where the league has kind of gone in a sense of veterans and the effect that it's having on these young guys, what's your take on that? It's awful, Jack. And this and this is the thing for me, and I've heard you speak about it before, when you had the David Wests, Jermaine O'Neal's, right? Like all those vets to really kind of set the tone for your, your career. I had Oak, I had Rick Brunson, I had Kendall Gill. I didn't know what I didn't know until I, I saw them guys. Oh no, being on time is being an hour and a half early if you're a young fella, yeah. right? Staying after, you can't eat McDonald's before the game no more. Like that stuff set the foundation for my career. And I think that's what's missing. For me personally, I went teammate of the year the year before. I go to Phoenix at first, we're trying to win. They say we're trying to win, we're trying to make the playoffs. But you can go back and check it out. Trevor Reeses gets traded. Tyson Chandler gets traded. Now it's just me and Ryan Anderson there. Yeah. So now we went from trying to make the playoffs, so we just, we play, we're going young. Mm -hmm. And so now you got to be a good vet, right? Yeah. And you should want to because you've had your run, but, it, you know, it's the younger guys' turn. That month, the younger guys are like, they, they're not, a lot of them not playing. And now I have my highest scoring month of my career. I have wow. 31 for the month of April. Wow. 31.6 assists off the bench, and we won half the games, and we didn't win shit that year. So winning half the games <laughs> was impressive. <laughs> Absolutely. Right? And y'all were getting mopped that year. I remember. Getting killed, I remember right? that year. Absolutely. And so winning half the games was something to me. I averaged 31, six assists in the last game. I, I get 51 and five off the bench. I just won teammate of the year. I'm like, oh, I know I'm going I know I'm gonna get a deal. I'm not saying I'm gonna get anything above minimum, but I know I'm gonna get a contract. Yes. I get nothing. And so I went through moments of depression. Like, damn, I couldn't even watch basketball. Bro, I couldn't even watch. As much as I love basketball and love the I couldn't even watch basketball for a year and a half. I didn't watch basketball at all. At all. And then the bubble happened. And I came back for that. And that's a whole nother story, but I, I hadn't played in 16 months or whatever. But I was depressed and I didn't know it. And my wife told me, she like, you would go to rooms and just kind of just disappear and come back. And I've never said this. I would go to rooms and kind of disappear then come back with the fam and just like, cause I, I, I couldn't understand why I was not getting a call. I didn't understand it. And all these same teams, why don't you come be a coach? Why don't you come run the front office? I'm like, oh, so you respect my mind, you respect that, mm -hmm. but you just don't want me on the court. Yes. And that part messed me up and it took me a while to get there. And then I had to be really reflected. I'm like, okay, if God said you have to go out, this is the best way I can send you out. Because, you know, obviously he knew. But it was just crazy to me. And, and I think Isaiah's going through it right now. Mm -hmm. Not the depression part, but just certain days where you just, you know, you're, you're like, damn. And I think what it is, is I think when you've had a following for a long time and you go to a team, that fan base is going to want to see you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that could be kind of a distraction for a team that's trying to grow young people. Interesting. And it took me a while to get to that point, right? Interesting. So if my name was Jamal Johnson and I was, you know, just the same vet, maybe I get signed with the same credentials, maybe I get signed. Mm -hmm. But if I'm me and I have some type of following and people want to, no, put them in the game, it could be a distraction. But what I will say to answer your question, sorry that was so long-winded. No, is, that was great. I appreciate I think it. There should be a rule that on every team, you need three guys that have 10 years and more experience mm -hmm. because you can help like slow some of the things that are happening down with the younger generation 
on and especially off the court. Because, mm-hmm. you know, we've had, we see it like, no, 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 slow down. Like, yeah. you got to move like this. And if they just have one it's, and it's still a bunch of young guys, that's not fixed. They're like, man, it's old dude. We ain't. Mm-hmm. But if you have three or two or three, are like, no, no, y'all need to slow down or you need to slow down. I think they hear it a little bit differently. I think that should be a mandatory. It'll help the league. I think it'll help the young players. It helps set their foundation. I agree 100%. I always talk about my vets that I had and how important they were to my career. Like, like you were just talking, J- Jermaine O'Neal, Jared Jack, uh, Carl yeah, Landry, Jack. David West, Zaza Pachulia, David Lee. Like, the list goes on and on. Andrew Bogut, like, Andre Godala. Yes. You know, and like these You just named things, seven right there. Like, I played with all those guys, all those guys I just named with, between years one and five, I played with all those guys. And the things that they taught, Richard Jefferson. Yeah, like, y'all did have RJ, okay. The things that they taught me, like, when you look at my demeanor on the basketball court, when I first came into the league, like, I was me, but I'm like, man, I can't get texts, I can't do this. And RJ was like, yes, you can. You should get texts. That's the only way you're gonna make it. It's like being that guy. You have to be okay with that. And I'm like, yeah, RJ, but I don't want to find at the time. I'm, I'm making yeah, a few yeah, hours. Yeah, I'm yeah, a second yeah. round pick. Like, I need this. And he like, but you have to look at it as an investment in yourself. That's real. It's like you you just have to be okay with that because who you need to be for this team, you gotta be okay with getting some of that. Speaking of, to you when you just said, it just hit me when you said when you start playing in David Lee. Mm-hmm. A lot of people don't know David Lee was an all star. I'll tell you a conversation I've never had, never said before. I remember it vividly. You could ask Steph. At the time, I had some buzz to make the all star. So did Steph. Yep. Yep. And I remember the game before, maybe a week before they pick. I'm like, Steph, you think? He's like, I think it's going to be me or you. One of us going to make mm-hmm. it. David Lee makes David it. David Lee made it. <laughs> I remember that. David Lee makes the all star. Fast forward a little bit, you basically replace and and kind of take over that position we played you in the playoffs mm-hmm. and we're all on the side like oh shit like we knew what was coming not the run you guys were going yeah. i'm not saying that but you personally we like he's a dog he's a dog and he's he can do it all mm-hmm. and that gave you guys a whole different versatility absolutely and that made us like it gave us pause like oh man like because you can you can do so many things that can't be accounted for and can't be duplicated, mm. especially with your group, right? So we're like, damn. We knew you guys were coming. We just didn't know, like, how where it would go, but we knew you were going to be at the center of it. And, and it was very interesting how it happened, too, because, you know, as as you know, during that time, you got Blake DJ. Yes. You got uh, Zach and Mark Gasol. Yep. You got Roy Hibbert and David West. Yep. You got, like, uh, you still had Timmy and Tiago Splitter yep, or sure Timmy did. and Boris Diop. Uh-huh. Moral of the story, you still had like two bigs, like traditional, big, like traditional bigs. Traditional yeah. bigs at the time. Real Marcus bigs, Aldridge at the yes. four in Portland. Yeah. Like you got real bigs. And it was interesting how it worked out because that wasn't me. You know, like I could bang with those guys. So we were just talking about Michigan State and everything that I learned. Uh, with physicality and all of those things, I could bang with those guys. So, and I wasn't going to back down, but I was very much so undersized for the position. For sure. And so, the way it in all, you look at it now, and it's like it feels like an eternity ago because the way the game is played now. He was way ahead of the curve. Do you give Mark Jackson credit for that? Like, what you know what I give Mark Jackson credit for? Um, because here's what I will like. I can't give Mark Jackson all the credit for that style. And by the way, Coach Jackson, it to me, is like, that's, like, it still baffles me that he's never got an NBA oh, job. Oh, I can't believe it. It's insane. I say it all the time. It's crazy. It's insane. I can't give him credit for that, per se, because the switch for me starting, like, permanently, actually came under Steve. Okay. I don't personally think Mark had the blessing or okay to even be able to do that. Because you think at the time, D. Lee is making $16 million a year. And an all-star. An all-star. And this is at the time where 16 is max. You know, like... 16 is 40 now. Exactly. Like, people hit 16, they're like, oh, like, that was max at that time. Right. And so I don't think he necessarily had the power 
to even be able to put me in the starting role. Whereas opposed to when Steve came in, Steve came in with a whole different power. Mm -hmm. uh, people forget when Steve first came in, he came in with a five-year, $25 million sure deal. Did. When that was a ton for coaches. Yeah, for he sure. He was a first-time coach. Yeah. He came in with a totally different power. And so, but what Mark, but but where I do give Mark credit is the confidence that he instilled in us to be okay with being us. The confidence that he instilled in Steph to be like, no, nah, dude, like I, I can remember vividly conversations with him like, no, nah, dude, you the baddest dude on the planet. This is before Steph Curry's an all-star. Bro, he said Steph and Clay were the best shooting back where we all was like, is he crazy? What's wrong with you? Everybody though. Absolutely. <laughs> what's, what's wrong with you, dude? Why, right. why are you saying these right. things? I'm we're like and we're in meetings, we're in the locker room, we're in practice. And he's like, Dude, you're the baddest dude on the planet. And I'm just sitting there like, this dude's you really he telling him he's the baddest dude on the planet. Right. Steph was just now starting to come into his own. Like, he coming off the ankle injury. I yep. remember my rookie year. Starting my rookie year, uh, before training camp actually starts, they're, this is when they're in talks about giving Steph the four-year, $44 million contract. And Ty Lawson, Drew Holiday, they all signed that DeMar same DeRozan, deal. DeMar DeRozan, yep. they all signed the same deal. And I remember this clearly. Steph came in for an individual workout. The owners, front office, doctors, everybody sitting at his workout as if we're sitting here in Hinkle Field House and Steph is working out right there. Like going through the draft process or something. Watching, watching. his workout because he was coming off the ankle surgeries. Mm. So they're trying to figure out through a workout, is he healthy enough to give him this $44 million? That is like, crazy. It's the most unbelievable thing. Meanwhile. Mark Jackson is telling us, man, you're the baddest dude right. on the planet. Clay Thompson. Like, Clay has no conscience. Zero. Sometimes to a fault. But guess what? What I've learned is your biggest fault can also be your biggest strength, right? And so sometimes even to a fault, most coaches would have essentially forced him to have a conscience. For sure. Mark Jackson fed that, like, no, nah, dude, you don't think shoot. Like, what, what are you thinking about? Shoot the ball. Right. You're that good of a shooter. This the best shooter in backcourt of all times, blah, blah, blah. And so what Mark instilled in us allowed us to become that because the confidence that he, gave. That he poured into us. I remember the very first day I stepped on, <laughs> one of my biggest pet peeves is when people call me too small. Like, oh, he's too small for the position. So David Lee got the ball in the post. D. Lee, that's my dog. That's my vet. <laughs> D. Lee got the ball in the post. And you know D. Lee. You played with D. Lee. He's my rookie. It's your vet. That's crazy. D. Lee's an asshole. Yeah. Like, I love him to death. Smart Alec and all that. Absolutely. I love him too. Yeah, that's D. Lee. So D. Lee gets the ball. He catches the ball in the post. I'm on this side. And he's like, oh, I got a mouse. I got a mouse. Mouse, y'all better come help. Oh, I that got just a mouse. Hurt. He's holding the ball on this side. I reach over, snatch the ball, throw D. Lee down, take off. Like, don't ever fucking don't call ever me fucking a mouse. Don't ever fucking do that. Are you crazy? Mark Jackson is pouring into that. Yeah. He oh, told me yeah. right away. When, as soon as I get drafted, I'm on the phone with him. I, I want you to come in here. I want to see the same Draymond Green I saw at Michigan State. Leadership, blah, blah, blah. But he's saying it and meaning it, though. Absolutely. So he instilled that in us. Like, where we believe. So then Steve come in. Steve implements a great offense. Mark Jackson had our defense on point already. Steve comes in to take the offense to the next level. So that's when the magic happens. And not only does Steve take the offense to the next level, but Steve takes the winning ways to the next level because he's one of the ultimate winners in this league. Yes, he is. Like Steve Kerr, if you look at the NBA, Steve Kerr, Phil Jackson, Pop, Pop, Pat Riley. Yeah, it starts getting very short after that. When you look at, when you bunch that group of guys together, they account for like 40-something championships in NBA history, if not more. That group of guys. Steve Kerr is in that He's group. He's in that group. Of guys. He's, it's the way, it's, the thing Steve Kerr has taught me about winning is insane. And so what Steve then brought was like, that, the offense, and the winning ways. 
And think about what you just said. You said Steve Kerr, Phil Jackson, Pop, and Pat Riley. Mm -hmm. The other two he played for. Absolutely. So all the knowledge he got from those two, right? And they may not see it exactly the same because I know Pop comes from the Larry Brown coaching tree, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Yep. So it's like the knowledge he's given, I'm sure the details you're getting, the game you're getting is just, that's priceless. Absolutely. And so that's where it, cha it really changed for us. Like Mark instilled it in us, but Steve took it to another level for okay. us. So that, was, that makes all the sense in the world. Okay. And which came at an interesting time because then that's also the time that we're running up against y'all. Live City. Yeah. You coming off the bench, which leads me to my next topic, six man. So I feel like you're in a very interesting space right now where you're becoming more known <laughs> for TV than you are for, like, we talk Lou Will. Lou Will's great. What Lou Will did, love it. But that started with you. And you're now becoming, you're not far removed from playing. No. But you're becoming more known for TV. Before we get into the TV thing, talk to me about your place in the six-man GOAT conversation. How you, like, you were kind of one of the first guys to really embrace that and make that a thing. Talk to me about that and, like... So, I've won since I was a kid. I won as a kid. I won in high school. I went to Michigan. I only played 17 games, but we won 13 of them. I wish y'all lost 13 of them, but we'll nah, talk nah, about nah. that No, no, no. My first one I missed was Michigan State. Oh. Mo, Mo, Mo Pete, mm -hmm. Mateen Cleaves, mm -hmm. Charlie Bell, that whole crew. And I remember speaking of which, Dick Vitale's coming to, he came to Christ for the first time in years because we wasn't, we wasn't doing much before mm -hmm. that. That's the first game in NCAA. Here you go. The first game NCAA tells me I can't play. And so it's an ESPN game, national crowd. And I'll never forget, Michigan State won the game. But Mateen Cleese came up to me like, little bro, it's all good. Keep your head up. And that meant a lot to me because here he is. He's a rock star. Mm -hmm. He's already a rock star. You know what I'm saying? But he came and showed love and... I felt supported, even though I didn't really know him like that at the time. But I've always won. And in the NBA, at this time, Dre is, is like, first off, there's positions. Mm -hmm. You playing a point, you playing a two, you playing a three. Yes. And also this thing like, oh, he's a good player. He's, he's, he's on bad teams. And I was tired of being known as that. And as fate would have it, I got traded. As, this is, I'm going to start my last year in Golden State. Mm -hmm. I, I leave and Steph comes the next year. Because I played with Monte. I wow. played with Jack, right? Wow. It was between the, it was a transition between the uh, We Believe team with mm -hmm. BD and, I mean, Monte at the moped and then Steph coming. So it was, the, it was that little gap right yep. there. And so I get traded to Atlanta and they already got their starting five. They got Josh Smith, Joe Johnson, Bibby, mm -hmm. Al Horford, Marvin Williams. Yeah. And Coach, and Woody, I love Woody. Woody was like, you ain't going to start here. I'm like, I ain't, I ain't got no ego. I'm cool or whatever. I come off the bench. I'm the second leading score, average 18. I should have made an all-star that year. Mm -hmm. can, let me speak to that real quick. Yes, sir. I hate that people ask people to sacrifice. Mm -hmm. They come off the bench. If I was starting doing the same thing, I would have made an all-star team. Mm -hmm. I averaged 18. My team is, I think, second in the, in the Eastern Conference when they selected the time. Yeah. I should absolutely be an all-star. Mm -hmm. But now nah, he comes off the bench. So it's frowned upon to, to select me but you you give me all this praise for sacrifice. Like, that don't add up. Yep. Something's not right with that. And then Lou Will, fast forward, he goes through it. He mm -hmm. averages 20 with the Clippers. They won. He should have been an all-star that year. Yep. One of the top fourth quarter scores. But anyways, I go there. I, I do my thing. And what I did know at the time, I won a six-man, was that it was changing the perspective of how the six-man was looked at. Yeah. Manu Ginobili was six-man. Jason Terry was six-man. It was appreciated. But... I almost gave it swag and gave it a face. Yes, yeah, sir. Like, you know what I'm yeah, saying? Sir. Like, okay, he's six, man. He got game. If he can do it, oh, it ain't so bad. Because, mm -hmm. you know, in our community, six, coming off the bench is frowned upon. Absolutely. Period. Absolutely. That's some childhood. Oh, you don't start? Oh, you weak. Yeah. That's just how it goes. Yeah. But come off the bench, doing what I did, doing it with swag, and still winning games and, and doing that, it gave it a face. And now every gym, like you said, I'm in the AAU world, so every gym I'm in, He's like, six man, I want to be a six man too. And that wasn't the case. Mm -hmm. So it's dope to see that. And one thing that's most impressive, and I saw this stat, and I'm not flexing, I promise. 
I'm fourth all time in fourth quarter score. Fourth. I'm the only person that's off the bench in that, in that conversation. And it's crazy. I think the other three, since they've been tracking, is LeBron, Kobe, Dirk, and myself. Wow. Off the bench. So I, I wear that with pride because mm -hmm. it's like you got shit done and moved mountains even though you're coming off the bench. Mm -hmm. That's interesting because Manu obviously was a six man for the majority of his career. His career, right. But it was looked that way differently, to your point. It was like, oh, he's a starter coming off the bench. Yeah. He's sacrificing. Absolutely. Yeah, like, absolutely. oh, he just don't want to yeah. start, so he's comfortable coming off right. the bench. So, you're gonna, so it was never viewed as, like, him being a six-man. No. It was actually viewed as you, like, being a six-man. Because it was like, Manu could do all these things, and I was more like a specialty, mm -hmm. special teams type dude. So it was more myself, Lou, we're looked at as that. But to answer your question about the GOAT conversation, I would never say I'm the GOAT of that. I think I'm in the conversation because mm -hmm. I think everybody, Lou has an argument, yep. Manu has an argument, he's mm -hmm. a champion. Jason Terry, hard, he came mm -hmm. off the bench before. Mm -hmm. Lamar yeah. Odom, like there's some dope six man. Ben Gordon was cold to win rookie of the year and six man the same year. So I give all them dudes their flowers. Kevin McHale, obviously, that left shrimp. Uh, but I think I'm in that conversation and however they see it, they see it. But I think, I, you let others sing your praises, so I let other people say it. But to get that respect, and get that love, you would never know I was a six man with all the love I get from people. Clay recently just came off the bench for the first time since his 30, rookie 35 year. 35 piece, shout <laughs> out Clay. Like, since his rookie year. Um, what, what would you say to Clay? Like, should he embrace that and say, you know what, I'm gonna be the six man? Should he continue like, no, I'm still at this level. I want to fight to be a star. What What would your advice be to a Clay Thompson? I actually reached out to Clay. Wow, really? I reach out to people all the time. I actually reached out to Clay before he came off the bench. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, because we talked about it on TV, and everybody's like trying to bury Clay. Yeah, I'm like, it's crazy. dog, he's still averaging 17 points. <laughs> it's crazy. I said, it's it's Clay is. The 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 fight is with himself because he's been so legendary for so long, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. 17 points on a great team is 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 great. Clay's battle is that, and obviously the injuries and everything. But with him, I'll tell him to embrace it. It can give him a whole nother wind. Like, we don't see legendary players like that, Manu we talked about, but legendary, legendary guys like that who have had four-time champions, averaging 17, like, I'm going to come off the bench. Mm -hmm. Now you're seeing second unit guys. Now you're the focal point of the offense mm -hmm. whenever, like, it gets you in the rhythm. Forget the off the bench or starting. You're going to have better numbers doing this than you would as you're doing it right now. Yeah. With more of a focus. And you may have more fun. And that's why I told him in the message, like, bro, have fun. Yeah. At the end of the day, like, have fun. Enjoy this shit. Because I'm here to tell you on the other side of it now, it don't last forever. You don't want to look back with regrets. Mm -hmm. Like, man, the last few years, I was mad. at. Like, enjoy it because it goes so fast. Like, and you've earned that. A lot of people haven't earned that right. You've earned that right. Like, mm -hmm. enjoy it. Embrace it and have fun. And speaking on the other side, I, I mentioned earlier, you're, you're becoming no, more known for, for TV personality and speaking about basketball, which I think is great. Like, because that just shows the success that you're having and doing what you're doing now. But it brings me to a conversation of, you're now on that side of things, but obviously you've done what you've done. But we live in this world today, and speaking of Clay, where certain people talk in this media space, and it's like what they say is Bible. <laughs> like, like, oh, the such and such said it. That's Bible now. Or, he said this, or she said that. That's what it is. Let's talk about that. Please, let's talk about it. Go. You got it. All right. Go. <laughs> I, I, my problem is basketball is one of the only sports or only things where you don't have to be a professional, a judge professional, and get people looking at it like you're the gospel. Absolutely. And it's crazy to me. Absolutely. Bro, I can't walk into Microsoft and tell Bill Gates, create this, or no, that what you're doing is wrong, you're supposed to do it. I think about how I'd be looked at. Yeah. If I walked into Microsoft, and I'm telling Bill Gates how it should look and what should be done, and this is Bill Gates. They look at you like you was out of your mind. Like I'm on something. something. Absolutely. But we allow it, and that kills me. Mm -hmm. So I know exactly what you mean when you say new media because it, it's crazy to me, like, 
there should be a certain credential that you have not to speak on the game. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that. Everybody's free to speak how they want. But to say it with your chest out like, yeah, and I said it, so you guys are going to fall in line for this. Ain't that crazy? It's, it's, it's insane. And so I, that part kills me. That part kills me. Bro. And I'm, I'm, that's why I think I have a responsibility to be in this space. And, and I've given so much of my life to the game, mm -hmm. as you have, mm -hmm. as like certain people have given their life. And for me, I'm not a hot take dude. Yeah. And that, what I'm saying, I don't mean, I may not say something that goes viral. I'm saying I'm always following the game. Yes. And I feel like the game will always lead me where I need to go. And I owe that to the game. Mm -hmm. The game's giving me everything. It's give, Nobody would know who I was, period, if I didn't play the game, right? Mm -hmm. So I owe the game. I'll never cheat the game. And so I, my thing is always follow the ball, follow the game. And if I follow the game, I'll be able to say what I feel is right and what's wrong. And you could do it in a way that's not tearing people down. Mm -hmm. You're just getting the point across and being real about it. You know, what's crazy is I, I always tell, like, football players, like I'm envious of you because they can only really watch and see, man, did such and such run for X amount of yards. Right. Did he throw for this amount of yards? What was his completion? How many passes did he complete? Uh, how many receptions did that guy have? How many yards? <laughs> but there's so much going on on the football field that people actually shut the fuck up. Like they're not going to they're not going to talk and analyze the game of football how they try to do the game of basketball because everybody and their mama think they know the game of basketball. But when it comes to football... Why, though? I don't get it. And so I always tell people, like, why, why do you think you should say that to me? And it's interesting because you get one or two reactions. Sometimes you get a reaction like, oh, my fault, bro. Like, you right, you right, right, right. But sometimes you actually get people that's like, no, nah, no, nah, be like, because this and that. And I'm like, yo, do you realize <laughs> I study this? More than anything. Like, daily, all day. You watch a game for two hours. I live this, breathe it, study this. That what makes you think in your right mind you know this the way I do? And they're watching it only from the lens that benefits them mm -hmm. or whatever they want their narrative to be. Absolutely. Bro, we see the game from so many different levels. I can tell you from the star point of view. Mm -hmm. I can tell you from a bench player's point of view. I can tell you from just a teammate's point of view. Mm -hmm. I can tell you what the coach is thinking. I can tell you how the front office is trying to put it together. We see it from so many different angles and a totally different lens. You can't even comprehend. Mm -hmm. So... What makes you think you know more about this than me? And I'm not saying we can't have a a, a, a great conversation mm -hmm. about it, me and this part X, Y, and Z, but I'm just saying in general, what makes you think that you're like, no, no, what I said, this is it, and this is going. And you may even bring up a good point within the conversation, mm -hmm. but you don't know more, bro. You just don't. You ain't put enough time in. Absolutely. It's the, and, and, and it's the bravado that comes with it. Right. Like some of these guys that get to talk, I'm just sitting there looking at them like the nerve of you. Like <laughs> the nerve of you. Like... How dare you? How dare you? Say that. The nerve of you. But if I come at you, you're wrong. I'm wrong. But who validated you? Oh, you're a bully, you? right? Like, like who validated this thing? It's in that and and now especially with social media, right? Mhm. Mm uh -huh. That's like a whole different thing because I'm sure some of these same people had the same thoughts, but now we hear them. Mm -hmm. We see them. Mm -hmm. And it's like, and now they're even louder because now they have a voice. And we might respond to them. Mm -hmm. And it, sometimes at the end of the day, they didn't even care about what they were saying. They just wanted a response. They wanted your attention. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. now you got to decipher through that. It's just a whole different, it's a different era, a different generation. But I feel like we need more basketball people in basketball. Absolutely. Talking the game, in the front offices, coaching. Like, we need that more often. Mm -hmm. I, I feel like that's that's needed. Absolutely. The game will be in a better place because of it. 100%. 100%. We, all, we, we, we spoke earlier about your involvement in the game, how you continue to give back. I saw the other day uh, you were showing Wimby <laughs> and a couple of young guys some moves. I don't think he pulled the move out in the game. You talked about having 10 new moves that people ain't seen. They ain't never seen them. All, and they would have seen them if I made just one All-Star game. This is my plan, right? This is my ultimate plan. If I made one All-Star game, and you know, how, your first All-Star game, how many minutes you play? 
11 maybe. <laughs> so that's what I'm thinking. If I make it, I'm ready to play seven. Yeah. But it was going to be seven minutes of funk. Every single time down the court, I was going to do a new move. Every time I touched the ball, I was going to do a new move. So how T-Mac had that moment where he threw off the glass and Absolutely. everybody talked about it, I was going to release one of those moves every single... I'm like, I'm never coming back here again. Why not? <laughs> Shit, why not, right? For they gonna, sure. They're going to remember me. And that was my plan. And so I never made it. And so now it's like, they in the vault, bro. They just sitting there. And I'm not passing to JJ yet because he's young. He's going to do it at some <laughs> point. It'll take him a while to learn him, but he would do it. And I want him to do it when he's when he's really there and yeah. he's ready for it so that he won't see him either. Nobody's seen him. Even the Wimby moves, like, that was just... I, we had him on, and I asked him if he could do the shake. He's like, yeah, I learned that when I learned the sham guy. And I said, yo, if you do it in the game with who you are and you know what, I'm going to just give you the full version of that move. You can have it. And nobody's seen it because it happened. I've only done it once. Mm -hmm. And it was when I first did the move. When I first did that move, I was 16 playing a pro-am, and I did the full version of it. And the guy, I was going, let's say I'm going that way. The guy went all the way to the left. And I, laid, I was going so fast, I had to catch myself on the wall. But that version I would give to Wimby, and I promise you it would shut everything down. And if he does it, nigga, he's been practicing. I saw him practicing the layup line in Miami. Somebody, in, again, social media sent me a video. And I saw it. I said, oh, if he does it, I'm going to show it to him. But I wasn't doing it that day because, one, he didn't do it. And, two, all the players start watching, too. I'm like, well, damn, if I give him the move now, everybody's going to do the same thing. So I was just freestyling with him. <laughs> Tell me this. Um, so I watch Wimby. I haven't gotten an opportunity to play against him yet, but oh, I watch man. him. And um, he's, a, he's a special talent, but I think it's going to be important for him to figure out what it is that, like, he almost can do too much. And it could possibly get in the way of his teammates because you start to float and you don't necessarily know where your place is on right. the court. Right. You know, like, uh, now he up there. And, and like great scores are going to move around, but most great scores, you know, like, you know where they getting it at. Wimby sometimes can get it here, get it there, get it all over the place. And I feel like as he moved forward, it could possibly interrupt the flow of his teammates if he don't learn how to shine. Now, what's your take on like his next level of growth and becoming who he can be in the league? Before he came in the league, I said, and I said, obviously, as a cheat code and pop, right? Mm -hmm. But I said, his skill, whatever he does best early, we don't know, mm -hmm. but it'll be highlighted, right? So Pop's going to play him to a strength, whether that's pick and roll, whether that's setting the pick, whether it's catching on a certain block, whether mm -hmm. it's getting in transition, whether it's trail threes, whatever it is, they're going to highlight that. The cheat code is Pop, though, mm -hmm. because I don't think Wimby's best attribute is scoring. Yes. I'm not sure what it is right now, but I called the game when they played the, the Hawks probably a month ago. And, and Dre was crazy because he does stuff you're not supposed to do. What I mean by that is he may do stuff in space and like, oh, that should be a floater. Yeah. Like anybody else, that would be like, oh, he got to a spot, that's a floater. He's getting to that spot and he's reaching around dunking. <laughs> and you're like, what? <laughs> like that don't even add up, bro. We ain't seen that. And then that game in particular, this is what I love about him. Pop brings him off the bench the second half. Really? Brings him off the bench the second. He starts the game, obviously. Mm -hmm. He didn't like the energy that group had. Brings him off the bench. And he came in in that second half, and he scored 23 points, but it wasn't that. He's blocking everything, and this is what you'll love about him. He's a little thing. As good as the talent he is, he's a little things dude. That's his game changer. So he's better than the hype. Not because of shit you can see. It's the shit you can't see. He's a little things, dude. Every single time he's sprinting, try to block shot. Every mm -hmm. single time he's running. Every single time he's in the right area on help. Every single time he makes the right play. He's a little things, dude. And this what really got me. After the game, I'm walking out. He's in the weight room. He, puts it, he, he sees me. He drops the weights. He comes down. He shakes my hand. He shakes my hand. He doesn't even say nothing. He just puts his head down. Like he wanted some wisdom or knowledge. I saw he's going to be great. Because he 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 wants to keep learning, the drive to keep getting better. But the little things he does, besides the big things you see, is why he's going to be out. He's actually better than the hype. It's scary. That's insane. Like I said, I haven't gotten an opportunity to play against him. But I actually think, to your point, I think his best attribute is his defense. Yes. He can control the game defensively. Right now, 
better than he can offensively. Yep. And he's already pretty amazing offensively what he can In do. In the Rising Stars game, he literally locked down the whole key. And I said it. I said, to win this game, you're going to have to get a mid-range shot because you can't go in there and you can't pull up a three. And my guy, uh, I want to mess up his name. Bozellis. Went to a mid-range. And I told Bozellis after the game, I said, I'm glad somebody did because you weren't going in the key. Mm -hmm. Even the shots he doesn't block, he alters. You're thinking about him. Oh, I can get this one off. He goes and gets one. You're like, damn, I ain't seen that. Mm -hmm. Like he's, he's, we use the word different so much, but he actually is different. Mm -hmm. I think what he is for real, I think he was a, a guard that he just stretched all the way out. So he sees the game like a guard. Yes. He's not like a big trying to dribble. He sees the game like a guard. Oh, boom, boom. That should have went right there already. Shoot it. Like, he's mm -hmm. like, I'm like, damn. It's, it's, he's, he's a different breed. Yeah. I seen it in person. It's crazy. That's exciting. The little things is what separates him, though. So if you're starting a franchise today. Yeah. All the guys in the league, you starting it with Wimby? Am I, is my franchise trying to go for it the next three years? Or are we trying to go uh, the let's next? Let's say you starting a franchise and, you know, you, you're, the, you're the owner of the franchise. So you could be tough going all in in the first three years. You know, like right. you you try to go all in the first three years, it can possibly set you back another five for to sure. six years. That's what I'm saying. Going for it in three years. So just say you starting it and the runway is the runway. Like, oh, yeah, for sure. There's no doubt. If it was three years, then it's like a joker, right? Or it's like mm -hmm. MB. Mm -hmm. But if it's like seven years or five to seven, yeah, it's him for sure. Now it's just about who's going to play with him. Mm -hmm. And to your point, Okay, what does he do best where we can we know what to put around him? Yes. You know what I'm saying? So that part of it. But if it's that, it's, it's without a doubt he's the one I'm starting with. Joker MB, who you rolling with? And why? MB's more dominant in that regard, and he should have won MVP if he doesn't get hurt. But I think Joker, when you just factor in health, I think he's, and health's nobody's fault. But I'm just saying, his style of play, he doesn't use athleticism. Mm -hmm. I have to go with Joker. Joker's playing the game backwards. And what I mean is, my man averages 30 points and he doesn't want to score. That's fact. That's a fact. Brother, I don't want to score. I'll, here, here, here. Mm -hmm. And he still gets 30. Then he can still play big boy basketball as well. Mm -hmm. But the way he flows and the way he plays, and he's like, he plays a lot. Like, he's not missing games. And it's not nobody's fault. Like I said, I had injuries. I missed a year before. But I have to go a joker. And and you, you just spoke on health, uh, which brings me to probably the hottest topic in the NBA right now, the 65-game I don't like limit. it, Dre. I don't like it. I, I love the fact that we want everybody to play. Mm -hmm. what, shit, I was in year 17. I played all 82. That's crazy. So I, I love the fact of playing. I was, man, for years I've been saying, before load management, load management when, we, when dudes were still practicing, mm -hmm. load management practice. Because these yes. kids, load management practice so these kids can see everybody playing. And Absolutely. it's good for the league, it's good for the kids, it's good for the game. So I'm all for it. This is not a load management uh, answer. But if you're injured or you feel you're injured or you're compensating something and you're like, I have to play just to meet a quota to be eligible for an award, then that's the part I have a problem with. Because mm -hmm. you know what? At the end of the day, the people that are voting, they still don't have to vote for that person. Absolutely. So we're going to save them from themselves? Absolutely. Oh, he plays, if this rule was never in effect, he plays 63 games, he had a great 63. I have to vote. No, you don't. Yeah. That's your choice. Mm hmm So I have a, I, I think somehow, I'm not saying the intent was wrong with getting guys to play because guys should play. Let me be very clear about that. But if they're injured and they can get injured worse, trying to be out there to, to meet a quota, that's the part I have a problem with. Like, we've actually seen two guys that happened to already this year. Joel. He's actually playing against us when he just hurt his knee. Yeah. I mean, I had already heard that the knee was not doing right, a good right. space. And they told us, like, <clears throat> if if it wasn't the game thing, he wouldn't play tonight. Then he played, hurts the knee. We've also seen him. We're here in Hinkle Field House in Indianapolis. We've also seen him with Tyrese Halliburton. Yeah. Tyrese came back from the hamstring. He's on main restriction right now. A little too soon. Yes. He's now been back for three weeks, and he's still on the minute restriction. Still on the minute restriction. But he's forcing it to get back. Why? All NBA. 
Because if I'm not mistaken, all NBA actually affects his contract, I think. Yes, it does. I think like maybe 41 million. Absolutely. 53 million. 53 million dollars. So he's forcing it to get back for that. But if say he missed three more games before pushing it to come back, right? I don't think you're looking at that at the end of the year like he missed those three more games. He's not all NBA. No, you're not. You're not. So we're trying to save the the voters from themselves because we're not technically putting it in a place where the guys are going to play more. He may miss more time if he gets hurt. Absolutely. And like people don't know. Yes, exactly. We don't even know when he's coming back, right? Mm -hmm. And that's not good for the game because here he is having an MVP season. He's not playing the All-Star game. His team is hurting. His team is... Their second, third, fourth, and fifth player can be the best they can be, and it won't matter if Joel Embiid is not there. Absolutely. So that part, I understand what they were doing, like I said, to get people to play. We want that. As fans who watched the game and talked about the game, we want that. Absolutely. So we're not saying that. But also on the other side of that, we can't have guys risking their health if they're injured trying to further play and injure themselves more. It's the unintended consequence. Right. That's the problem. Right. You know, you're getting these guys who really hurt, and it wasn't necessarily intended for them, but they're catching the consequence for it. For sure. So what's the right thing? Okay, if maybe it's, maybe it's not, I think it shouldn't be attached to their money. Mm -hmm. I'm not a component of he has to play this many games to get eligible or all NBA to get eligible. I mean, that's a bonus, obviously. I'm, I'm not sure what the right thing is. I'm sure they've had these conversations. They've had to, right? You made all NBA? I have before, a couple times. A couple times. Not What's your recent. take on it? My take on it is, um, <clears throat> I think the 65 game rule is, is pathetic. I think, um, I, I totally understand wanting to get guys on the floor yes. and have it. But, like, this is the NBA. We know when somebody really hurt and when you actually, like, low managing. Right. So my thing is do the work. Like, really do the work and know who's actually low managing because they keep all these notes. Like, For sure. Every time I go in the training room. Oh, everything's tracked now. It's tracked. Yeah. So you know the truth. Right. Like, you know if I'm in there L and every day with this knee and all of a sudden, two weeks later, it's just gotten to a place to where I probably can't go tonight. <laughs> you know. You know. Because you've seen on my log that I've been in that training room for this right now. Every day. Every day for the last two Before weeks. and after practice. Every day. I have to be in there or else it's just not in a good space. Right? So my thing is do the work. Like, don't punish Joel and B. Because say this. Say if Joe was hurting at that time, and then he missed seven games instead of the two that he missed. He missed seven. And then he comes back healthy and on the same terror that he was on. Can he still win MVP? Can he still make an impression on voters whose the last impression in their mind was how he was dominating, then he missed seven games, and then he come back and pick right back up there? Can he still win MVP? If he can, in the voters' mind, then let it be. Let it be. What if a person runs in, player X runs into player Y's knee or ankle, step, whatever, and he misses 10 games because of it? Mm -hmm. How are we penalizing him for missing 10 games? And that part, that's the part that needs to be tweaked. And now he, he's not eligible because he may miss four more and then two more. And now mm -hmm. he's not eligible for or three more, whatever. And he's not eligible to be for those awards. Mm -hmm. You don't have to vote for him, but he shouldn't be penalized yes. if he has real injuries to deal with. That's, that's my thing on it. I agree. You sit on the side of media now. I sit on both sides yes. currently. Uh, but, and also understanding that media makes decisions that does, that can decide Impact, yeah. whether Tyrese Halliburton makes 53 million. Is there a better system that we can come up with than time. Because here's the thing, Ma. I may not like a reporter, and that reporter may not like me for whatever reason. Maybe I didn't give them an interview when they right. wanted an interview. 
We've maybe, been there, right? maybe they said something that I didn't like and, and I, I said say something nothing. back yeah. to them and they didn't like that. And so then they don't vote. Should we still be in a space where our money is decided by their emotions? By, because they're human <laughs> beings. Like, we, right, like you can't tell me they're it. not biased. They're human right, beings. Right. No. Hell no. Are you serious? No, no way. There's no way because they're going to always feel personal about that. Oh, you Absolutely. didn't speak to me, or I, I said something and I didn't like how you responded in front of people. Now I'm a little embarrassed, or whatever it might be. No, and that's why that part of it is why we love that you're in media. We love that players are in media because you guys are in are in it, like truly in it. You're in the locker rooms. You like I hate when all oh, source said this. Put a name to it. Mm -hmm. I used to back in the day, Dre is. I would see something somebody said, they would have to wait. Because you got to think, this is just papers, just mm -hmm. newspapers. Mm -hmm. So something comes out, the next day it comes out. By the time you address it, the next day it finally hits the paper. So that's a two to three day span. Absolutely. So I love that players are taking the power of their own. You can end it in two seconds. Mm -hmm. Literally. You can have your own press conference for millions of people in two seconds to get things right and straighten things out. And I love that part of it. Before we get out of here, uh, who you got winning it this year? I think, to be honest with you, I think the West, Denver's always there. I think Phoenix is built for the playoffs. Mm -hmm. And I don't think they're done. I think they're going to get a guard who can kind of organize and kind of, I think they are missing that. And I think they're missing the backup big. And I think the Clippers are rolling at the right time. They are. I saw your eyes jump up when I said the Clippers. They are. Take yourself out of it. Now I need you on the media side. You ain't the player side right now. I need you on the media side. Are the Clippers the one team that you look at like, okay, they can really go do this if they stay healthy? For sure, because they have everything. Um, they have a Hall of Fame point guard. Yes. They have a Hall of Fame shooting guard. Yeah. <laughs> they have a Hall of Fame small forward. Yes. They have a Hall of Fame point guard the, on the bench. Yes. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> um, now, and maybe a, a Hall of Fame coach. Absolutely. Yes. Now, aside from that, they got Biggs and Zubats, and who's kind of more of a bruiser. Uh -huh. And then you got Plumlee, who's kind of a little bit of a bruiser, but also fast and athletic and can keep up, like, on the perimeter and, like, can pressure a big that can't necessarily handle the ball and get back to the rim and defend the rim. They got Norman Powell off the bench who's scoring the basketball at a very high clip. Mm -hmm. They got role players. I think they have a lot. Now, health is obviously yeah. for anybody. But yeah, like, for, that's for everybody. Everybody has to be healthy. But I think they have anything that you need to compete for a championship. And like you said, it's coming together at the right time. But also, aside from them having everything that you need, they got guys that need a championship. James Harden need a championship. Paul George need a championship. Russell Westbrook need a championship. So they starving. They hungry. And guess what? All those guys I just named are closer to the end than they are the beginning. Right. So they know that. Way closer to the end <clears throat> than they are the beginning. So they know. This is it. This is probably my best chance and last chance. Right. It's the Michael Jackson if I don't do it now, yeah. <laughs> it don't happen. It don't happen. You know? And so I think, and, and then now you put all that into account and you got Ty Lue orchestrating it. And Ty Lue know what to do. He know what to do. In those situations. You don't panic. At all. You know, I, I, we're not going to go there, Talu. You know the love I got for right. me. This man brought us back 3-1. I don't want to talk about it. But <laughs> Ty, Ty Lue, I'm surprised know. you gave him love to the Clippers because, you know, we came a long way with that Warriors-Clippers thing. Absolutely. But, you know, we smacked them up enough to where I can get our love and, and, and you know, be all right with it. I, Ma, I, you know, I got uh, two questions for talk you. Talk to me. You remember when word got to us when all that happened? that if we walked out and didn't play, mm -hmm. you guys was on board. Is that real? Were you guys really not going to play if we didn't play? 100%. Uh, this is when Donald Sterling, yes. uh, the recording came out yes. with Donald Sterling. The game that night, if you go back and look, 
of the game was us versus Mm y'all. This was Adam Silver's first big decision he had to make. Shout out to Adam Silver. Yes, it was. Who's been the best commissioner. By far. Probably in the history of sports. But this was his first big decision that he had to make as the commissioner of the NBA. And it was Donald Sterling with the Magic Johnson thing, the recordings coming out, the races recording. And we had a game to play that night. And Steph was talking to Chris. Mm -hmm. Um, D. Lee was talking to somebody else on y'all team. Andre uh, talking to CP as well. And we were talking about what are we doing if the announcement essentially doesn't, or if we don't approve. And it was, well, we're going to go out there on the court, like we're lining up for the jump ball, and we're walking off. What effect do you think it would have had had we done that? I think it changes. Now with how things are in the world. I think, I think it changes the landscape of the NBA. I think it changes the landscape of how athletes view themselves in this whole what athletes place, how athletes view their place in this whole business. Because as time has gone on, we figured out more of our place, mm-hmm. but we still don't have a stake in it. And I think with that move, if we had made that move, I think we have stake in it right now. So that's a move that could have outlived all of us. 100%. It would have been on CNN. It would have been everywhere. on. It would have been everywhere. And and what it shows you most importantly is, all right. Guess what? Go play. Go play. The game don't go on. It's over. We're done. We're not playing. We're walking off. The game doesn't go on. On one of the biggest stages at the time, right? <laughs> Us versus y'all. Playoff stage. Playoffs. Beef. You're right. Everybody's watching that series. It's over. You're a warrior. Give me four other warriors. I know we're about to get out of here. Give me four other warriors you go to warrior. They can't be on your team. Just in the league from your perspective. Can't be on my team in, in the a league. Fox so. Okay. Warriors. Like, you got it. We going to play in the roughest, toughest, whatever in the world. I need four warriors to go with me. No pun intended. Not warrior warriors. I'm taking, uh, cannot be on my team. No, they can't be on the Golden State Warriors, but I've, four that are built like you to go somewhere. I'm play. taking uh, Bron. Okay. Um, I am taking Ja Morant. Mm. He ain't backing down from nobody. That's a great call. Okay. He, what Ja say, I'm running up the chip. I'm running up the And he running up the motherfucker. <laughs> I'm taking Ja. I'm taking Braun. I am taking uh Hmm, that's interesting. <laughs> that's interesting. I'm taking um Cause see, here's the thing. They with me. I can bring the dog. So I just need guys who got the dog. Like, as long as you got it, enough for us to stand on, I'll, I'll bring it. You bring it. So, Ja, so I need you to be nice. <laughs> like, but we need but, the dog too, though. But that's what I'm saying. So these are guys who that are like, dog. Oh, absolutely, they, dogs. Like, but they nice. The dog yeah. And ja- but, like, they nice. Like, yeah, yeah. So what takes the cake is how good they are. Right. So I need those guys. Okay. Like, All right. I'll do, the, I'll do the other shit. I can't I, wait to hear these last like, two. So I'm taking those two. I'm taking, uh, I'm taking Joker. Man, You're taking y'all, Joker. Man, y'all, they be talking about. That may about, be the most shocking thing I heard today. Man, that dude, an animal. He is an animal. He oh, you ain't got to tell me. I just told you how great he was. He an animal, though. Like, he don't talk. No. He don't flaunt it. You ain't moving him off his spot. No, nah, hell no. Nah. You're not rattling him with no. nothing. Nothing. Like, nothing's rattling him. Nothing. 
He an animal. I'm taking him. Okay. And he's nice. Oh, he's, he's like, an all-timer already. I'm taking Joker. You got one more. And my last one I'm taking is... uh. Shea Gilders Alexander. Ooh wee. He talked to JJ yesterday. And it wasn't the, and I'm saying that to say this, it wasn't the, oh, what's up? It was like the talk you had with him in, in the Bay, in the mm -hmm. finals. Mm -hmm. It was a real talk. And to hear him, I said, he's a, he's a dog. He's a dog. He's a real dog. He ain't no, he ain't no fake dog. Mm -hmm. Like, he's a dog. Absolutely. And so his mindset was impressive to hear. So it's you, Ja, SGA, Bron, and Joker. And Absolutely. them five dogs can go anywhere. Anywhere. And get it done. We're going to Serbia. We're climbing anywhere, up the shit. Anywhere, that's Serbia. what I'm saying. <laughs> anywhere. We're going anywhere. That's real. And we got, obviously, the talent. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But each one of those guys that I named stand on business. May do it quietly. May do it. Yeah, some are loud, some are quiet. Right. They're going to do it. But they stand on business, and I respect that. And you talking guys like, these are all guys, by the way, that carried low. They stand on business, yes, though. Yes, they do. And they dogs. And I got nothing but respect and love for those guys. So, like, the common answer would be, like, Pat Bev, you know what right, I mean? Right, right, right. But, like, I'll bring that. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'll bring that. Like, Myself, I'll, I'll bring that. So give me somebody who a dog, but they can go do all that other shit that I can't go yeah, do. Yeah, yeah, And them the guys. Do you see anybody else that can be, who can be the next, not to a T, not perfectly molded, who can be the next generation of you Tari in the league Eason. right now? That's my, yeah, my way. Tari and you said that quick. You thought about this. Yeah. He, he, I love that kid, man. He, And I don't know what's happening right now in Houston. I haven't seen him play a ton, but I haven't heard a ton about him. So I don't know if he's playing a lot this year. You know, it can be tough with coaching changes and right. different stuff. Um, directions of organizations. All of a sudden, they was getting smacked last year. White, like mopped across the court. And then now you bring in Ime, mm -hmm. you bring in Fred, you bring in Dylan Brooks, you bring in guys, Jeff Green. Winners. You're trying to change it. And sometimes young guys can get lost, lost in, in that. that you for know? sure. And so I'm not sure if he's gotten lost in it or not. Like I said, I haven't seen him play a ton. But from what I've seen from him, he can dribble the ball. He can shoot it okay. But you can, you can, like, you can better a Crazy jump shot. Crazy motor. Yeah. You can better a jump shot. Yeah, you can So he can that. dribble the ball. He's... A good athlete. He's not crazy freak athlete, but he's a good athlete. Great length, great size, rebound the ball, ain't like not soft at all. Right. Like, ain't backing down from nothing. Like, does the little things. I say Tari's. Now, you gotta get in the right situation. All you that, but he's all the one. Us, but I love his game. I love what he brings to a team. And I think he got a chance to be, like, that next guy. If he embraced it, though. You know, because a lot of these young guys wouldn't want to embrace being me. You know, like, it's not sexy. But it's so important. I, I've very rarely, and I've studied the game for a long time, very rarely have I seen two teammates that were as connected and leaned on each other like you and Steph. Facts. And it's, it's amazing. When I watch, I just I laugh. I'm like, this is because I, when I was in competition, I didn't see it. Mm -hmm. But now I'm, I'm like, this is 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 beautiful to watch because you guys are switching roles within the game. Mm -hmm. Like it's you know what I'm saying? <laughs> like it's crazy to see. And that's the Chinese riddle. That's the one that nobody can figure out. It, it's so funny you say that because CP and being with us now, he come up to me and he's like, yo. You and Steph should switch positions now. Like, you take the ball and him run into drag. I'm telling you. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm watching like, it. And, and me and C haven't even talked about that, but I can see it. It's crazy to see, but it's beautiful. And I, you guys will go down just as the connection of two players and their success. I mean, obviously you have the, 
the Jordans, Pippen, Shaq, Cobb, all that. But you guys will go down up there with duels that are just as connected and lean on each other just as beautifully. I appreciate that, nah, bro. No doubt. No doubt. My man, Ma, thank you. Always, bro. Yes, sir. Anytime. I, you already know. Man, always a pleasure. I could talk basketball with Come you on, all man. day. Savant. Thank you, my brother. You're a savant, bro. Absolutely. For sure. One of the goats. It's a wrap. Appreciate y'all. Peace.